Uh, thank you to the President and Vice President for their invitation. Uh, I'm sorry I don't speak Catalan. Uh, I hope I can make myself understood. Uh, I'm going to begin with some famous Chinese wisdom, which says, may you live in interesting times. Uh, so from my few days in Barcelona, I have learned that you are living in interesting times. Uh, but I don't know the details of the political situation here. Uh, I'm going to be silent about the situation and instead talk about the historical background. I want to talk about the history of the relationship between rights and sovereignty. And my main idea is going to be that the rights of individual people were for most of modern history inseparable from the rights of collective nations. In a second part of my lecture, I'll turn to the history of the right of self-determination in international law through the era of decolonization. And in both parts of my talk, my main idea is that for a long time, humanity understood that the rights of the individual would be guaranteed through the collective assertion of sovereignty, not a dissolution of sovereignty in the name of borderless markets or technocratic supervision or global humanity. So I'm going to be opposing what I'll call the post-1989 story. In the aftermath of the Cold War in the world, the idea of sovereignty, Westphalian sovereignty especially, fell into disrepute. In October 1990, the president of Germany, which had once been for sovereignty, explained in his words that sovereignty now means just participating in the international community of human rights. So in this view after 1989, political community meant existing states and regions, but above all, being part of the human community. And in moral and political philosophy, really for the first time, something called cosmopolitanism took the lead. And the main idea was that everyone is human first and foremost local identities, including national identities, melt before our membership in humanity. Now, this narrative seems premature, I think. My country caused, in 2007, a financial disaster, and now the entire world is beset by crisis. And this narrative about humanity seems premature. Now, Obviously, we know that the crisis through which we're living could be a bad thing if it just destroys the dream of a borderless world after 1989. Remember, we've lived through, in our history, the collapse of relatively liberal ideas after economic shock. After 1929, the dreams of liberals all over Europe were dashed by the rise of frightening mass, move mass movements and frightening versions of nationalism. In fact, memories of fascism and Nazism became central to morality after 1989. People thought that the, the state and its borders were affronts to our common membership in humanity. And anyone who insisted on the moral importance of groups or nations was for a long time seen to be on the wrong side of history. In particular, if you advocated the idea of international human rights, your goal was to supersede the nation state, to put nations in regional entities like Europe or even the global community of citizens represented by the United Nations and its human rights covenants. Now, those fears, I think, are not misplaced. If we consider not Catalonia today, but Hungary 
we do have reason to fear that the economic crisis could lead to a dangerous version of nationalism. And yet, maybe this isn't the whole story. The post-89 narrative could be replaced with something worse, as this Hungarian story tells us today. But it might also be replaced by something better. And so that's what I want to pursue. The main idea is that while we have good reason to value individuals and their rights, it was only in recent times that this dream got cut off from the importance of specific national political enterprises, and especially from the nation and nationalism. And in our age, I think we've seen that the economic crisis may have shown our attempt to defend individuals above the nation might have been mistaken. After all, globalization and cosmopolitanism, which were supposed to expand our solidarity after 1989, haven't given people the kind of solidarity they want. They seem to be returning to the nation, not just for ill, but also for good. I don't see how otherwise we could make sense of the several separatist movements that have appeared, especially in Europe today. You might say it's as if the economic crisis has revealed what should have been obvious to us all along, the fragility or weakness of a solidarity we could achieve only at the level of the whole world or at the level of vast regions. We now know that it's very easy to care about global suffering when we're rich and about the human rights of other people, but not when we're poor and jobless ourselves. It's cheap to care about global human rights, and it might encourage us to charity for distant strangers, but it's expensive to live in a network of obligations for fellow citizens close to home. And it seems as if, in response to these insights and experiences, people are returning to a sort of solidarity closer to home. It might be more local, but it's deeper and more substantive, even if it's also more costly. So I want to start my talk by making an argument about where individual rights came from in the first place. As you probably know, the idea itself is very old. Scholars debate how old. In the 17th century, natural rights were invented uh, by philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. But in their view, rights were about constructing the state not getting rid of it or overcoming it to have global humanity. I could tell a long a story about their 17th century thought, but I'd rather turn to the revolutionary experience, especially the Atlantic revolutions, because it's then that the ideas of natural rights and les droits de l'homme, the rights of man, became politically potent. There was that 17th century background, but in the late 18th century also, we find that those who announced the rights of man were out to build a state for themselves and were often interested in national liberation too, not global humanity. And so if that's right, we can't easily see the rights of man as like our global human rights today, because they were about a local political achievement. So my understanding is that some Catal Catalans are for independence today from Spain. The first group to claim independence from a larger entity were my countrymen, the Americans, in their Declaration of Independence of 1776. And it's a a fantastic example of what I've been saying. They declared natural rights. They said they were self-evident. 
But the consequence of declaring the rights of man was to win collective independence for their nation. And if this was true in America in 1776, it was even truer in France in 1789. Article 5 of the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen says the nation will rule now, not just individuals alone. And the French Revolution was the inspiration for the most powerful force in modern history, collective nationalism. Note that in the 19th century, even though human rights have been declared by those revolutionary movements, we can't find anything resembling the international human rights movements of the 20th century. Somehow, the first implication of rights was for a long time nationalism, whether on the ruins of empire, as in the American case, or the ruins of monarchy, as in the French case, and so many European cases that followed. I think there was one leading theorist of the rights of man in modern history, uh, and he was an Italian named Giuseppe Mazzini. And he was for rights and the individual. He had a banner made for his movement, which was called Young Italy. And on one side of the banner, liberty, equality, and humanity were the ideals written. But then on the other side of the banner were the ideals of unity and independence, national unity and national independence, separate from the rest of humanity. And this was, I think, in conformity with the main idea of human rights in the 19th century. It was the ally of not just nationalism and sovereignty, but the nation state as a political form. Mazzini took this very far. He wrote, the epoch of individuality is over. It secures individual rights, but we need something more powerful, the nation, to found collective association. Uh, and he supported lots of means. I'm not sure you will follow him in this regard, but uh, he supported not just moral persuasion, but uh, violence. Uh, among other uh, writings he gave us are guerrilla manuals, and he was one of the first supporters, not just of human rights, but of th theorizing guerrilla violence in modern times. But it was for the sake of rights through the admission of Italians to what he called the fellowship of peoples. Now, this development, I think, was the central one when it came to the idea of rights. It was inseparable from the collective. It might have involved constraining the state from the inside through things like constitutional protections, but it never involved constraining the nation state from the outside in the form of international legal protection of individuals. That idea seems to be non-existent through most of modern history, certainly in the 19th century. A philosopher named Hannah Arendt put this very well. She concluded when she looked that the rights of man declined as an idea in the 19th century not because they were forgotten, but because people understood that to be human meant first and foremost to found or reshape your local political community. And as she wrote, the rights of man came to be treated as a stepchild by 19th century political thought. No party in the 20th century saw fit to include human rights in its program until World War II. If the laws of your country don't live up to the demands of human rights, she wrote, you should change your laws through legislation or by revolutionary action. And people followed her advice through modern history. They didn't give rise to our bloodless human rights movements beyond borders for the sake of global 
or even regional citizenship. If we disagree, something must have happened. We think of human rights as against sovereignty and certainly as against violence. But that's not what they meant until recently. What happened? Further, we think of human rights as something mainly for those abroad. But in this tradition, it was the sake of ourselves as we founded nations. Something has happened. Now, even when we come to the 1940s after Adolf Hitler, we find this link between rights and sovereignty very strong. So in the post-1989 narrative that I mentioned, something called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights became famous. It was passed as a resolution by the United Nations in 1948. People came to believe that it anticipated our search for universal human rights above the nation state after war and genocide. But actually, if we go back and look at its text, the Universal Declaration imagines no such move beyond the nation state. It's true that World War II bred the widespread opinion that economic disaster would lead to military conflict. And it was a welfarist moment when people wanted their nation states to accord welfare rights, economic and social rights. But it wasn't a document about getting rid of sovereignty. After 1989, many people came to think it was Adolf Hitler who gave sovereignty a bad name. And they came to think that sovereignty and rights were like oil and water. But not many people in the 40s thought this way. They did acknowledge the need for international economic governance. Uh, the Bretton Woods system would keep the 1929 crash from happening again. And they did believe in collective security led by the United States. But they mainly thought that the political form that should rule the world is the welfarist nation. And most people who heard about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 40s understood what it says it is in its words, a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations. It's a template for the globalization of the nation state and the globalization of sovereignty. This is, I think, a, a good memory. After World War II, people didn't turn against nationalism. They did want to find the right kind that would protect rights, including welfare rights. Now, I want to turn to the second part of my lecture, which is about self-determination as an ideal. I've been telling a story in which, for, for most of modern history, individual rights were connected to the rights of nations. They were part of the same program. But through the end of World War II, this program only applied to a very small part of the world. Uh, Western Europe, uh, the United States, and Latin America. Most of the world was still under the rule of empires in 1948 and it would take a long time for them to fall. When we turn to the history of the idea of self-determination, we get a reverse story. Actually, historians have shown that the idea of self-determination originates in German philosophy, connected to individuals, not groups. So in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and others, it's an idea that is for the sake of individual self-determination and freedom. But by the 20th century, it also became a collective principle. In World War I and II, uh, at the end of it at least, politicians like V.I. Lenin and Woodrow Wilson announced that the world would be organized around the nation state and through national self-determination. 
But Wilson especially thought this promise applied only to the old European empires that were dying then, like Austria, Hungary, and Russia. And so the Poles, for example, did get national self-determination after World War I. Lots of people, though, weren't satisfied with Wilson's restriction of national self-determination. Many uh, came to Versailles to ask for their right to self-determination. This is a crucial moment in world history because it's the moment in which Mazzini's idea gets globalized. Wilson, when he came to Paris for the Paris Peace Conference, actually stopped at Mazzini's grave uh, to pay his respects. But Wilson wouldn't let colonial peoples have their nations. Famously, Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese communist, went to find Wilson in Paris in 1919 and said, what about our national self-determination? But he couldn't get in to see Wilson. After World War II, things changed. But it took a long time. The interesting thing is that when the Allies, especially the United Kingdom and the United States, announced their war aims in 1941 in the Atlantic Charter, they said that they would bring self-determination to the world. They revived the old Wilsonian idea. They said, the War would be about respect for the right of peoples to choose the form of government under which they want to live. Sovereign rights and self-government will be restored to those from whom it has been taken away. That's in the Atlantic Charter. But the same thing happened. Churchill, when he helped write the Atlantic Charter, only meant Adolf Hitler's empire in Eastern Europe. He wanted it to be freed and restored to its sovereignty. He definitely didn't mean his empire or empire in general. And so self-determination, having lit the world on fire and excited the hopes of so many colonial peoples, was again shut down by the great powers. And Churchill got Franklin Roosevelt, my country's president, to agree with him by the end of the war that the war wasn't going to be about decolonization, self-determination, but only in a few places. But then we know what happened. People who were still connecting rights, nationhood, and violence stood up and insisted that self-determination go global. So let me read you three texts from the later 1940s. The first remembers America's natural rights of 1776. But then it says the following. Now this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live, be happy, and free. A second text says, if there are natural rights there's also the natural right of the people to be masters of their own fates like all other nations in their own sovereign state. And the last text begins, we the people, just like the Constitution of 1788-9 from my country. But then it goes on to say that sovereignty is now about welfare in the sovereign state. And in fact, this text puts economic justice before political justice. Now, none of this is really new if you have followed me. For most of modern history, rights and sovereignty and nationhood were bound up with each other. What was new is who could claim these uh, projects. Those texts are the Declaration of Independence of Vietnam in 1945, the Declaration of the State of Israel in 1948, and the Indian Constitution. Uh, But, of course, it required a lot of others, and in fact, all three of these groups, uh, it cost them a lot of violence and blood to get what Mazzini had said everyone should have back in the 19th century. And in fact, 
because there were so many new states in the post-war period, the idea of self-determination became the highest ideal in the world for most of the post-World War II period. If you look at major United Nations documents, uh, like the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples, which was passed in 1960, self-determination is the highest ideal. If we look at the human rights covenants today, which were finalized in 1966 and ratified, came into force in 1976. Collective self-determination has become a human right. And in fact, the very first one, so there are two covenants protecting human rights, and the first item on the list in both is the following. All peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Well, then what happened? It doesn't seem like nationalism and self-determination, precisely as vehicles for individual rights, are held in very high esteem anymore. Maybe Catalans will get them, but they will have to struggle to us, even to assert their right to self-determination, even though it's the first right in these global documents. Well, what happened? I think a new idea came, which was our international human rights. It was new, I think, with respect to the past in three ways. First of all, it broke with the idea that local collectives were the agents to secure people's rights. In the age of human rights, people came to want to reach the individual directly from on high at the level of the globe or regional entities like Europe. And collective groups that were local got folded into bigger groups or indeed humanity as a whole. The second change was that self-determination was domesticated. So in the age of decolonization, it was asserted externally to set up new states with new borders. But uh, the fact is that a lot of people never got self-determination. When we leave beside the rhetoric, we find that actually decolonization took up the same borders that the colonial powers had originally imposed. And so lots of peoples still don't have states. Catalans are far from alone in this respect. But through the experience of decolonization, self-determination entered a moral decline. It was once romantic, and now it seems dangerous. With a very few counterexamples, minorities have not been allowed to secede. Bangladesh, Cyprus, Eritrea, East Timor, South Sudan, parts of Yugoslavia, at the price of violence, did get their way. But most nations remain minorities in other people's nations. And the world doesn't seem to want to change that fact. Why? Well, one development was that self-determination became internal. People were willing not to give people states, but give them local rights, uh, local autonomy or language rights, which was seen to be just as good from the perspective of self-determination, even if it wasn't the full package of political self-government. I think these two changes are connected to a third change, which is we reject violence. Whatever we might say about Mazzini's ideals of rights, nationhood, and sovereignty, most of us aren't willing to take up guns to get them. Or when we do, we aren't willing to let violence rule. We would rather not tolerate violence. But the sad fact is that secession, 
has almost never happened in world history. The achievement of the nation has almost never happened in world history without violence. So in the place of the old model, nationhood, rights, and sovereignty, we have a new model, international human rights. And I think this break happened because of decolonization. Of course, at the start, decolonization globalized sovereignty and nationhood. But by the end of it, people observing the global scene were so depressed by how bad the new nation states were that they tended to want a new strategy, individual human rights separate from their old agents, the nation, sovereignty, and violence. A, a very famous intellectual in my land named Arthur Schlesinger Jr. who worked for President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy put this very well in 1977. He said, I've realized watching decolonization that states may meet all the criteria of national self-determination and still be scars on the planet. We should drop self-determination and take up human rights instead, which is the way of reaching the deeper principle, individual self-determination. And then there was a conceptual problem. Who is the self in self-determination exactly? Nations, we now think, aren't given by biology or race. So who decides where they come from, where their borders are, and who's included and who's not? So in view of this conceptual problem, uh, people turned against self-determination as incoherent, at least until we know who counts as part of the nation. I gather, for example, the Spaniards think the Catalans are part of their nation, but the Catalans don't. Who decides? Here's what one international lawyer said about self-determination. Who, who decides which collectivity can claim self-determination? After all, in every nation, there's going to be some other minority whose self-determination isn't recognized. And any group of individuals could claim to be a group demanding self-determination, but we wouldn't give the people in this room a nation. And so where do we draw the line? So the ideal of self-determination doesn't explain who gets it, and it's a major difficulty with it. And so it's also for that conceptual dilemma that I think we moved to individual human rights. After all, each one of us is an identifiable individual. Nations are fictions. Individuals seem more real. We could protect them directly. But there was a final factor in this history, which is not as rosy. The global individual became the dream of the post-1989 narrative at a specific moment. I said the nation state in the 40s was alive and well, and what was new about it was that it was welfarist, protecting for the first time or promising to protect economic rights and social rights. But human rights became popular in the world precisely in our era when welfare states were under attack. And in some places, like the United Kingdom and my country, were almost completely destroyed. That's eerie and disturbing, I think. The 1970s and since have been about destroying the nationalism and welfareism that most countries shouldered at some point in modern history, and in the 1940s mainly. Economic liberalism as an idea was dead in the 1940s, but now it's alive and well. We didn't notice when 1989 gave us the high idealism of cosmopolitanism and global 
rights. I think it's because we were happy because we were increasingly rich for several years. We were proud of ourselves for achieving distant solidarity with suffering strangers, but we didn't tell ourselves that it was cheap compared to the local solidarity that was expensive and that we were destroying in our welfare states. You could put it a different way. We learned to be cosmopolitan fellow humans after 1989, uh, but we owed less locally as tax and transfer obligations within our welfare states collapsed. And austerity policies to our, in our day want to take this dynamic further. They want to starve our states of their incomes and use the latter to oppose deficits, not for the sake of social safety nets. Against all this, it seems to me that the history I've been telling is very relevant. The rights of nations could be one of our principal ways of resisting globalization in economic terms and insisting on our welfare rights, not for humanity, but for our fellow citizens in our local communities. I think after 1989, we forgot that solidarity is first of all achieved locally. We can convince fellow citizens to take out their pocketbooks and contribute to government only when the government represents a local community and society. And however far globalization has gone, it hasn't created global community. It was easy to be citizens of the world when we were rich and could write checks for our fellow humans around the globe but the same period was one when we learned to write fewer checks for our fellow citizens. And I think the best thing you can say about nationalism and sovereignty is that it may allow us to reverse that dynamic. In general, the era of wealth and abundance after 1989 seems like a distant memory except for a global financial elite who seemed to be doing fine. Since 2007, I think we've learned that when we thought we were citizens of the world, we were really entering an era of a global market with all its ups, but also all its downs. We didn't succeed at the time in entering a solidaristic community in which we would pay a lot to our fellow man uh, or be able to rely on our fellow man for welfare as opposed to charity. And I think this is a bad thing. So the rise of nationalism in our time, including separatism, could take an evil form, as in Hungary today. But I think at its best, it could provide something good rather than evil. At the very least, it gives us a valuable memory from the past of modern history in, when, in which rights were about nationhood, sovereignty, and collective emancipation. Even as late as the 1940s, I've suggested, there was a time of very substantive, even though very costly, solidarity, though it was local rather than global. I think that solidarity is something we've lost due to the rise of international human rights and uh, uh, the rise of new forms of global finance. Human rights became what united us at the level of the globe. But for most of modern history, it was the nation uh, that provided more substantive uh, welfare and it may be that we should return to the nation if we can make it for that reason. So I'll stop there, and right. whatever you'd like to do now is fine. Thank you very much.